<laughs> Good morning, February 8th, 2019. Welcome to episode five of Afro Lanikin Legal Academy's presentation of Afro Lanikin jurisprudence, Afrocentric legal history, and its extraordinary commitment to the equal protection of law. Uh, today's topic, we're going to talk about the tale of the eloquent peasant, the tale of the eloquent peasant, uh, due process and equal protection for the poor in ancient Kemet in the Nile Valley. And again, uh, this deals with Old Kingdom Egypt and Middle Kingdom Egypt, which we believe is most intimately uh, tied to the African interior, um, as in contrast to uh, Syrian, P uh, Persian, Greek, uh, um, Egypt or Kemet that um, occurs after um, the fall of the 25th dynasty. So we concentrate here on the legal structures of Kemet in its earliest times and its times most closest to Nubia and Nubia again being our jump off point for the rest of so-called Black Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa and the basic legal structures and, and, and more than just the structures but the themes and the concept of mot and justice that um, over that overgirds the entire political structure, um, we believe is uh, more or less unified, um, basically African in a sense, and permeates um, the, the states that come thereafter for the next several thousand years. Um, so again, this is a great, uh, we started this with our Black History Month, um, February 1st. This is February 8th. This is episode five. I know uh, I tried to do this daily, but um, we're going to try to do them as quickly as possible. It's turning out to be more or less every other day, but we're going to keep continuing and uh, um, pecking away at it. It's a lot. Um, for those that thought we could do uh, 6,000 years of African legal history in a couple hours, you're going to be um, hopefully pleasantly surprised at how much there is to consume. And this is even the top tip of the iceberg. I don't present myself as a historian. I am a tax law professor, administrative law professor. And um, this approach um, is interesting to me because, again, in the American Association of Law Schools, we tend to take a more Eurocentric approach. So um, I hope you enjoy this traipse through African legal history from a different perspective. Uh, please uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Afrolanica.com. I know that sounds like a website. Maybe we'll try to switch it up, but Afrolanica.com is the uh, YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Uh, check out all the videos, uh, at least the last four. Uh, this is episode five. Uh, again, I am also the executive director of the e Economic Justice Law Review. We're also on Facebook as, long, as well as online. Uh, and please go to Amazon Kindle and buy my latest book, Taxes, Death, and Trouble, How Starve the Beast Tax Cuts Created the Black Lives Matter Movement. I'll say it again. Taxes, Death, and Trouble, How Starve the Beast Tax Cuts Created the Black Lives Matter Movement, right? How uh, uh, constantly cutting taxes for the wealthy and uh, uh, transferring the incidents of government uh, uh, from wealthy and white to poor and black. Um, basically winds the the wealth gap it puts such pressure on us through informal taxes uh, fi criminal justice fines fees and fortu forfeitures until there's uh, nothing left and you have the 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 Mike Browns and the Eric Garners who die because they no longer can breathe okay back to our uh, talking about uh, afro and jurisprudence and the tale of the eloquent peasant uh, on episode one we gave a overview of the book 6,000 years of African history episode two we were more specific about the over 20 different political states that existed in Africa prior to the 16th century and again when we're talking about a state we're talking about uh, a, a nation with um, a ruling class or, or, or ethnic group um, can, in control over several provinces, each with their own governments, control basically through taxation and sometimes military prowess, right? So we're talking about an intense bureaucratic legal system with multiple levels. And there were several ubiquitous throughout the uh, African continent prior to colonialization. And we just want to make 
uh, it more real and describe it in more uh, precise detail so that we can help destroy the myth of black inferiority um, as far as um, white supremacy being a, multi a mental condition. Okay, I'll try to speak up. I know um, it's not as loud as, as some folks. And so after pre-colonial statehood, we talked about the origins of law uh, and how it emanates or, or is represented by the female goddess Mott, how it's put in action or judged by uh, uh, Toth, um, how it go, um, uh, ancient Egypt uh, legal structure was made as, at its most pristine in the old kingdom, the first six dynasties, uh, partly because of the genius of uh, folks, viziers, who are basically chief justices, attorney generals, prime ministers. Uh, of the of the state underneath the pharaoh, but with immense power, and one of the greatest, one of the greatest black men of all time, Imhotep. And then for um, our last uh, episode, we talked about someone lesser known, uh, the teachings of Tahotep, P T A H, Hotep. Tahotep, who is the author of the oldest book that we know of, right, over 6,000 years ago, and it's about jurisprudence. It's about legal theory and how to uh, uh, um, um, uh, subvert the will of the individual decision maker and constrain it towards justice, right? And it's so interesting because he talks about a fair hearing, right? So we have the the uh, foundations of administrative law in the teachings of Tahotep. And we understand that these uh, stories and fables and, 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 and treatises were copied and distributed uh, uh, throughout the 3,000 years of e uh, Egyptian history. And its popularity t leads us to believe that these were more or less um, law books, that these were uh, the books that as a scribe or a judge who were trained, um, this is what you would read to basically um, instill within you this sense of justice, balance, harmony, order, again, all the things that Mott uh, represents. So today we're going to talk about the tale of the eloquent peasant because it's an extension of this idea of due process law, uh, um, uh, this idea of administrative law, the the law or right that governs bureaucracy that that makes uh, each individual bureaucrat subordinate to the state, so that when they make a decision, we I don't want to say trust, but we accept that it is the judgment of the state that the law did it right. Not this person. I didn't deny you the law denied you this. So have a problem with the law, have a problem with the regulation, but don't be mad at me. I mean, you can be a little bit mad, but it's not my fault. I am doing what the law told me to. This is the essence of the rule of law. Now, again, this is conceptual. And we're asking folks to believe in something of a fiction, uh, but it is a fiction that that creates what we understand as social stability. I want to say social stability uh, uh, um, instead of order because that order has a certain connotation that I'm not afraid of, but I just don't want to deal with um, how we can pick that apart right now. So I'll say social stability, law and social stability. And that was a huge thing in ancient Egypt, as this actually attests to. Um, Got to understand the time period uh, here, and we'll get into that. As a matter of fact, let's talk about the players. Uh, before we get into the story, let me tell you about the players in this story. Uh, number one, uh, Kun, Kun Anup, K-H-U-N-A-N-U-P, Kun Anup. He is our eloquent peasant, right? Uh, he is from outside of the city and perhaps even outside of Kemet, which is really interesting because he goes into Kemet. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, he's married. He has children. He's a farmer. Um, in the beginning of the story, uh, his simple nature is is expressed in the story. This is a uh, the teachings of Tahotep was a very short book. It is considered the oldest book in the world, but the tale of the eloquent peasant is even longer, right? And it's more in detail and, and reads more like a, a traditional story or fable or, 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 or um, that we were accustomed to. So Kunanup is uh, uh, he's a farmer. He's a peasant farmer. Uh, we don't know if he owns his own property or whether he's a, sh a sharecropper or, or, or the case there. But we do know he has a, a farm. On the other hand, this is a parable and it is a fable. So uh, or I mean, based off of pre probably a real story, but it's embellished through the years to teach us something. And so when he loads up his donkeys to come into Kemet, into town, Hiriakalakapil. Uh, 
polis. Uh, he brings with him so many goods that we have to assume that this represents peasants generally, right? Um, number one, uh, he instructs his wife to uh, take the bar their barley that they grow and um, turn it into bread and beer for him. Right. At first, you think that he's going to trade the bread and beer, but no, he, that that's for him. So again, it, it um, expresses his simpleness. Right, bread, beer, what common folks are eating at the time, simple staples. But when it comes to the description of what he's carrying uh, in for trade, um, now we get a sense of how diverse the Egyptian economy is, and and all the goods that are traded and the things that you could be a farmer of and also specializing in in town so vines salt sticks natron i don't even know some of these what some of these things are so don't forgive me nuts edge wood panther hides jackal skins pond weed stones and there was a whole bunch of different stones plants and a bunch of different stones uh plants carrots serpentine mint hedge plants pigeons birds fish shrubs beans anise so um, this is what initially leads us to believe Kunanup is again representing, um, is a character representing poor. He may have been real himself, but as the story grows, um, he's representing all these farmers or the farmer class. And I'll even explain more why we, I, I believe that's the case here. And, and again, it's a very important tale that connects due process of law to equal protection of law. And when we talk about equal protection of the law, we're talking about poor versus rich in class and, and things of that nature. Uh, the other person in our story is Nem Tanakt. Uh, he is a rich minor official in town where uh, Kunanup is, wants to go trade his goods. Um, he's a, more or less a lieutenant of the high official or the governor. Um, I'm not sure if he's a mayor or whatnot, but we don't know that he is an administrator. He's an official. He has a certain amount of power, and he's also very wealthy. And um, that's going to be a very central theme here about the confluence of wealth and uh, political power. And it's very, very advanced for its time. It's really interesting. Uh, Nem Tanakh has uh, servants. He has employees. He's very wealthy. Um, and he covets Kunanup's goods. He sees them down the road. He sees them coming. So he's got a lot of stuff and he wants it, right? And he wants it, uh, but not by force. Uh, and the interesting thing is he has servants, right? He has people that work for him. Uh, Kunanup is poor. If he really wanted to just take it, he could just take it uh, by force. So this is, again, another interesting thing at, at this point in Egyptian history where the law is in such detail and such order and expected as such that um, uh, that we're not going to forcefully take someone's good, especially as a high official, but he's going to do it through deceit and trickery, right? To get around the law, to use his knowledge to, uh, of the law um, to more or less entrap and snare someone who is less sophisticated, but, he's, but, he, but he doesn't know uh, about uh, how dope Kunanup is. Um, and the interesting thing about it, again, this fable is very, very, very well crafted. Every time uh, Nemtanakt uh, does something to Kunanup, uh, takes his goods or beats him or, or whatnot, uh, anything about him, he never does it himself, right? He never individually restrains or takes Kunanup's goods, which is, I think, a very important part of the story. This is not mano y mano. This is about constraining the wealthy, constraining government officials. Every time he does something to Kunanup, he sets about some of his employees to make that happen. And it's very interesting that the uh, teachings of Tahotep um, addresses subordinates and how to about resisting uh, unlawful commands. Um, it's very interesting. Again, it's very administrative law e law ish. Our third player in the story, um, or fourth or fifth, because uh, again we don't want to exclude Kunanup's wife holding it down at, um, on the forefront. Um, Renzi, uh, son of Meru, he is the provincial governor, right? He's above uh, uh, Nemtanak. Right. He is uh, um, Nemtanak owes his position to Renzi, the son of Maru, uh, and he is going to be our um, uh, governor and also appellate court. Um, he is going to be the one that exacts justice. Again, we talked last um, 
episode about when we talk about due process and we talk about branches of government, they can all can exist in one person. So we all so three functions of government are to lay the law down, to execute the law, and then to be judici uh, to judge over whether the law was in fact broken and meet out penalties. Uh, here we don't believe that the um, the governor gets to create the laws that that is the province of the council of state the pharaoh uh etc but he is all, uh, definitely in charge of executing it on the one hand and also acting as a judge on the other hand uh and we note that re um, remember when it came to the teachings of tahotep you're supposed to read that so you can know as a son father to son um how to be a gentleman how to be learned how to be a scholar how to be a judge how to be a decision maker all within the context of mod justice, harmony, um, um, balance, order, etc. Um, however, it's interesting because it seems also that Renzi is also dependent on Nemtanak, and that's an interesting dynamic between the wealthy and the political. Uh, on the one hand, Nemtanak is lower than Renzi. Uh, however, Renzi is afraid or perhaps afraid to do justice so as not to offend his subordinate on whom he relies for his own wealth. And this is all about, again, whether wealth is uh, and the pursuit of wealth should trump the pursuit of justice. Um, it's a, it's quite a rebuke to, um, or at least a cautionary tale to today's uh, law and economic scholars who uh, who definitely or or um, make a good living out of uh, prioritizing economic efficiency over so-called abstract justice or what the Egyptians would have called mat. The fourth player in here uh, is Pharaoh Nebkure, uh, and that gives us a good timing of this particular um, story. So it is uh, the story itself claims that this happened under the Pharaoh Nebkure, who was believed to have ruled in the ninth or tenth dynasty, right? So right after the fall of the old kingdom in what we call an intermediate period. So this is wonderful in that it seems to describe what what we mean by intermediate period, what was going on at that time that Egypt was not, quote unquote, great. There were dynasties, there were kings, there were ruling before um, they, they, most times we believe in an intermediate sense that the Pharaoh no longer controlled both upper Egypt and lower Egypt. Now here it says that Neb Kare is the uh, pharaoh of upper and lower egypt and yet he's part of the ninth and tenth dynasty which most people attribute uh to an intermediate period but nevertheless um, um we know that this is used or becomes popular around 1850 bc again we're talking 1850 again before there's any invasion of africa from the outside before there's a greece before um, um other events that you've heard of uh, that this is from the 12th dynasty, it is part of the Middle Kingdom, and part of the norm setting of the Middle Kingdom to try and reach back to the Old Kingdom for its greatness. That this is an example of what happens when we don't respect uh, truth, justice, harmony, balance, and order. When we don't respect Mott, when everyone is not treated equally, right? That's when we have such um, um, angst. And, and disorder. Uh, let's see, uh, where? It's very clear, um, very from the beginning, and it's a very interesting statement that Kunanup goes down south to Kemet. Okay, he, he goes down, he packs up his goods, he's a farmer, he's going to sell them, and he goes down south to Kemet. So where is Kunanup? Right. Uh, he is in a, in a wadi or a city uh, outside. Um, and we're going to, um, for purposes here, I'm going to just put him out in the country. Um, when I say country, I mean town versus country. Right. This also not just class. This also reads as a slither city slickers uh, versus the quote unquote country bumpkins or whatnot. Now, we could try to infer that Kunanup is from lower Egypt to the north or even outside of Egypt and that would make this story even deeper 
uh, when we talk about equal protection. That would make this a story about not just class, but uh, alienage or foreign versus domestic. And, and, and if we are arguing that each person is supposed to be treated as an equal, regardless of whether they were a citizen of Kemet or not, then you're we're really deep into a commitment to an e uh, equal protection and one greater than is uh, known in the United States this time. If you look at the cases of Hamdi uh, and others um, regarding enemy combatants and whether they have rights. Um, so it specifically denotes going to Kemet. It also denotes the fact that um, um, Nemtin Akht will, will make a statement about uh, his upper Egypt barley. And so here we also note that that this town, Hiriolakopolis, in uh, southern Egypt, uh, the one closer to the African interior, is the wealthy place. It is the place where the traders are. It is where people of uh, the nobility is controlling things. So again, in this discussion of whether of upper Egypt, lower Egypt, and this Egypt being a story of how power and authority transferred from the first dynasties down south and uh, between Nubia and, and, and Upper Egypt and how that power seemed to shift over 3,000 years towards the Mediterranean, finally ending up in the hands of the Greeks and the Romans and becoming going from matrilineal to patrilineal, from matriarchal to, to pat patriarchal. So this is part of that story. Right. But at least it, but we want to focus on the uh, um, um, old kingdom and the middle middle kingdom, because we know those kingdoms and those dynasties, again, were closer in time to uh, and closer in allegiance to the African interior. Um, but also note that when we talk about Kunanup being a farmer and all those different um goods that he brought to represent all the different crops and things, uh, the, the diversified produce of uh, Egypt. Um, also think about the way it does, uh, if you read the story, read how it describes the city, how it describes a town. And this is not the major town. This is not the biggest town. It's one of uh, a, a great town, but this is the town is where the goods come from farms and then are processed and then made into more um, 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 processed materials. So they, they take the raw stuff from the farmers and then convert it to provisions. Kunanup is under orders from his wife to take his barley and all these goods and come back with provisions for the family. Why does the family need provisions if they had beer and barley, if they were growing all this stuff, if they were bringing all this, wouldn't they just take a piece for themselves and then sell the rest? Why are they taking all of this to town and then getting provisions to bring back to town, uh, back to their um, um, abode, back to their home? Again, we're showing the sophistication. Uh, this story is also showing the sophistication of the social order at the time that, again, no hardly different than today. Uh, even if you are a farmer um, in today's world, you still grew specialized in a particular crop and f the most of the things that are in your house or that you eat or consume are still store bought. Again, it's probably not as intense to today, of course, but it just shows you how sophisticated and how orderly, um, how um, similar these societies were. There's even a quote about um, factories, processors, jobs, wages, right? Um, and the interesting thing about these factories, processes, workhouses, jobs, wages, is these are people that make a living without having their own land. And so working class people, People that are not the nobles don't let, let's look beyond Renzi Nemtanak. Nemtanak has people who work for them. They are mentioned in the story several times as basically just employees. And so these folks are very dependent on the existence of the state because they have no land. If the state were to break down, how are they going to eat? So this idea of order that every um, that farm, everybody does their job, including government officials, so that everything can be fair and that everything can uh, work um, um, as it ought to, is of particular concern to citified people, especially citified uh, people without uh, great amounts of wealth. Um, Okay, uh, now 
before we get into the story, we're going to get into the story. I'm sorry. I know we're 20 minutes in. I haven't even given you the story yet. Um, but I, I just think that the setup is just in the context around what we're talking about is just so important. And so, again, from a legal perspective, this whole story starts as an issue of property law. So again, when we're talking about ancient Egypt, we're talking about administrative law, we're talking about government structure, but I also want to talk about things like contract, property law, the, the common law stuff, the private right stuff, right? And the interesting thing for you law students, if there's any law students watching this, this is all about an easement, an easement. Okay, for those that are not in law school, what is an easement? If I own property, I own real estate, right? There can be an easement on my land. I could grant it to someone. There's a, um, a lake on the side of my land or the other side. I don't own the lake, but I, I don't own the, own the lake, but I own property attached to the lake and people walk through it to get into the the lake right to use the lake to boat to swim or what have you now on the one hand I could have granted them that I could have given them that they could have paid for that on the other hand there are certain circumstances in which we will grant that easement even against the property owners wishes so here is an issue about an easement uh, Nemtanak owns a lot of property um, Kun Anup is trying to get his goods to the market and he's along the road and Nemtanak sets up a trap basically by closing his property, closing the way to the market, except as it goes through his property. And as it goes through his property, he lays clothes and other items out there on it so that Kun Anup has no way around it other than to more or less trample on it. Right. So, again, is this a trespass? They make the story even deeper as he's trespassing or as he's, he's, he's trying to or, or using the easement, whichever one, as he's trying to get, uh, navigate Kunanup's property and he's trying to tell Kuna, uh, temp, Neptunak, I'm not trying to touch your stuff. I'm, 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 I'm doing as I ought to be. I'm not trying to cause any trouble. Um, his donkey eats a wisp of the barley. He has no way around uh, this easement or that uh and and it's laid out uh Nemtanak has barley and water and and his land and then there's a cape on top and there's no way around it but as Kunanup tries to navigate it and get through and not trespass and not trample Nemtanak's property his donkey eats just a taste of the barley up oh, got you so now Nemtanak again Nemtanak is an official Right. He's just not is not just wealthy. Right. He's also a decision maker. He's also a lieutenant of the governor. Um, we're not sure if he's a mayor or whatever, but we know that he's referred to as an official. So not just wealthy, but he has an he has authority, his official authority. So as so the moment uh, Nemtanak's donkey um, um, uh, uh, touches, uh, eats the corn. And here we go. And let me even show it to you. Beware peasant. You will not step on my clothes. Then is my upper Egyptian barley to be a path to you? Like warning them, like don't step on my stuff, right? That's my stuff, but there's no way around. Kunanuk saying not I'm my fault. He's trying to be respectful. He's trying to do what he's supposed to do. But then here we go. Will you then not allow us to pass on the path? But one of Kunanub's, uh, Kunanub's donkeys ate some of Nemtanak's barley, a wisp, right? So Nemtanak takes his donkeys and his goods, right? You trampled on my property. You ate some of my property. And as a government official who has the power to judge, right, uh, especially smaller cases, he, find, he, 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 he takes his stuff. Well, Kunanub doesn't fight it, right? He promises, okay, well, I'll, when I get to the market, with the rest of my stuff, I'll come back and I'll buy back that donkey, right? Um, but isn't Renzi, especially if I'll go see Renzi, son of Meru, and he's the one who restrains every thief in this land. Shall I now be robbed in this district? So now he's talking back, all right? So note this, again, this is an eloquent peasant talking back to a government official, right? Um, and what happens? Well, as would happen today in a lot of instances where you're supposed to be legally entitled to free speech. But what happens if you actually do, in fact, talk to about to a police officer? Yes. Nemtanak uh, has Canute beaten with a stick for disrespecting him and now takes all of his stuff, takes all of his donkeys, takes all of his goods. And again, remember, Nemtanak doesn't do it himself. He sets his guards on him. 
sets his employees out on them, right? Dudes that had nothing to do with this, but now they're drawn into the evil, right? This is a this is how what happens when a government official is corrupt, it brings everyone else into it. But uh, Kunanup uh, is protesting. You beat me. You robbed my goods. And you even deprived me of the lament from my mouth. I can't even say nothing. All right. So here we even have a reference to something akin to free speech. The idea that even as the accused, even as a subordinate to the law, I'm not allowed to speak. Right. You beat me. You robbed my goods. And you even deprived me of the lament from my mouth. So here now we're going to start with this story, right? The story of power versus law. Uh, Kunanup spends 10 days pleading for his goods back from them to not. Now, interesting thing for me, and again, I, I don't, I, um, I am not uh, adept or fluent in, in um, um, hieroglyphics, and I wish I were, because something is telling me that um, not that he just pleaded for 10 days for his goods. I feel like uh, something about the story makes me feel that he was imprisoned for stealing for 10 days by Nemtanak, that this is something of a petition, uh, an appeal from, from uh, more or less habeas corpus. But we're going to put that to the side because I don't have enough evidence to say that. Um, but we do find that after 10 days, he petitions, right? He wants to, he goes into town, the peasant pleads before the high steward, Renzi, son of Meru. And he is now, we're going to call him the governor, right? Um, in the story, he's also been called the high steward. Now, it doesn't seem at this time that there are official courthouses, right? It doesn't seem like there are official courthouses at this time. It's informal because he finds Renzi outside his house, right? You, everybody knows where the governor lives. So to appeal for justice, he goes to the mansion. Now, this is a little different than um, the teachings of Tahotep and some of the other older works that say that the Pharaoh's job is to, to walk every day out amongst the people so that the people could find him instead of having to go directly to their house. But um, he finds Renzi and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and seeks to uh, uh, basically appeal to the court to have his goods returned from them to not. Now, they, again, now here's another interesting piece of the story. As he approaches Renzi, again, this is a governor, right? And we have lots of different levels of of uh, or class here we got the peasant we had the workers we had uh them to knock we have rinse we got the pharaoh um the other people not so named and so it's interesting right here where the um rinse uh he uh, Kunanu offers to Renzi from the outset that you don't even have to hear me. If you tell, if you can give me one of your subordinates, I will tell him the story and hopefully let them decide. That sounds a lot like a magistrate judge, right? And remember, these fables are in the background and hopefully the actual uh, um, um, situation thousand years after or hundreds or centuries or, or millennia after are even more sophisticated. And, and basically using this to justify the idea that, OK, there are courts, but these courts can also delegate authority to a magistrate or fact finding judge. And we'll see again how this plays out. But as the as he finds out the story, Renzi is a little hesitant when he finds out that Nemtanak is the defendant. Right. On, on account. And he says all this is on account of a little natron and a little salt. Right. Basically, he's dismissing this peasant like you want me to hear this complaint about one of the nobility when all that you lost was a little something. Right. So he doesn't answer these officials, nor did he answer the peasant. He basically it seems like just wants this to go away. But Kunanup appeals directly to the high steward. Right. He appeals directly to Renzi. And here is where we now get into the tale of the eloquent peasant, the eloquence of his speech. So from here forward in the story, uh, he basically goes on. He, <laughs> um, he rails on on the on the judiciary, on the government officials, um, on why, on what is it that they are doing? Why are they not fulfilling their responsibilities of a good judge? He goes into a beautiful philosophical soliloquy regarding truth and justice and order and hearings and all that. So here we go. Let's go down a little bit of it. 
So when he speaks, he's speaking to Renzi. Uh, I said, if you go down to the Lake of Truth, you will sail on it with a fair wind. For you are a father to the orphan, a husband to the widow, a brother to the divorced, and an apron to the motherless. Right, buttering them up, and that's how right the honor you to give judges, but at the same time reminding them of who they are supposed to be. And I like to hear when it says a brother to the divorced. So again, we have family law already established and taken for granted in this story. Let me make your name in this land according to every good rule, leader, free of greed, free of arrogance, destroyer of falsehood, creator of truth, do justice. Can't get more direct like that. The word justice or mot is, is evoked in here many, 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 many times. And he says, now this peasant said these words in the time of his majesty of the king, upper and lower in Egypt, Nemkare, the ninth and 10th dynasty. Uh, so when C hears all this, uh, he doesn't make a decision. He doesn't want to um, um, punish Nemtanak, a wealthy noble that's under him and responsible for the wealth that he enjoys. But at the same time, he knows he knows Kunanup's right. He knows it. Right. Of course, this is ridiculous. He just took his goods. It was he set up a trap for him to trample over the goods and have him eat a little piece of barley. And for that minor offense, he gets to take all his goods, take all his donkeys. He knows that's not right. But what to do? So Renzi goes before Pharaoh Nebkare to tell him about Kunanu, the eloquent peasant. And so here we have, um, on the one hand, the story of, okay, one official going to the other, other, but I'm pretty certain that you can tell right here what we're talking about is judicial review. We're talking about having a right to appeal. And the interesting thing about this is, just like today, we're not going to redo the trial, right? There is going to be an appellate review. We're going to have a court of higher resort oversee the under the lower court's decision, but we're not going to redo the trial before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is going to receive the record, right? You're not going to testify anew in front of the Supreme Court. They're going to bring the record. And guess what? Six, five, six thousand years ago, here we go. Neb Kare says, you will delay him here without answering anything he says. Don't make a decision. Don't say anything yet, but keep him here so that he keeps speaking. Remain silent so that his speech will be brought to use in writing. Then it will be brought to us in writing so that we may hear it. Astounding, right? Astounding. An appeal by a record. Right. In the, in the teachings of Tahotep, we hear about a fair hearing. We hear about a petitioner being able to say all that he came to say. Right. Because even if everything can't be grant, granted, uh, a, a good hearing soothes the heart. Well, here we have the idea of an appellate review. And instead of hearing the testimony itself, uh, have him record and record everything this petitioner says and then bring it up to me so I can refuse the decision on record. Um, and here's an interesting thing about equal protection, uh, something perhaps even, again, greater today, a little more extraordinary to, than today. The Pharaoh is aware of, of, of what a legal suit costs, right? Not as far as um, hiring a lawyer, but as far as time and expense. You have other things to do. And that's always a barrier to justice for people without means. So the Pharaoh commands, but provide sustenance for the wife of this peasant. But provide sustenance for, sustenance for his wife and children. That one of these peasants comes here is because his house is empty, right? I already know. If he if he came into town, if he came into the city, is because he's trying to get something. Because he's broke. Furthermore, provide sustenance for this peasant himself. However, however, the the pharaoh and this is interesting. I really don't even understand how deep this is and what the purposes of it is but but the pharaoh does this and says but don't tell kunanup where the provisions come from don't tell the wife where it comes from uh give it to a friend of his give it to a friend that will then give it over to kunanup so that he will accept it so that he won't know what's going on um, it's really interesting about the norm setting or the recognition of social norms here that even today that um it takes a little uh imagination to try to understand 
Uh, Renzi, son of Meru, the governor, sent a message to the mayor of the Wadi Netrun, where he came from, about uh, where Kunanup came, comes from, about making provisions for the wife of this pe peasant. So here, this simple statement also, again, represents bureaucratic order. It represents a supremacy clause that this comes down from the Pharaoh. You may be the governor of your province. You may be the mayor of your town. But when the Pharaoh says X happens, it comes down the chain and it goes down. Right. Um, so this idea of confederacy, federalism, federal, state, local is in effect five, six thousand years ago. Uh, and so now we have our appeal process. Kunanup is held over. Um, he is asked to participate in his appeal and that to to give his testimony and, and his um, 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 his speech, put it on the record for the Pharaoh. Now, he doesn't know that this is happening. He doesn't know that he's being asked to basically give it all up. Talk. Uh, they want him to. He's so eloquent and philosophical that that's also part of the story. Well, if he's so philosophical, if he's so wise, I'm, the tale of eloquent peasant isn't actually correct. I mean, to me, it's the tale of the wise peasant. I mean, this guy, his wisdom is so deep that the Pharaoh wants to capture it. They want to inc include it, not just as, oh, convince the Pharaoh that you're wrong, but this fable, this parable, this proverb is because this peasant knows somehow what justice actually requires. And so let's record it and pass it along, use it as our text, our, 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 our principles to guide judges and scribes who learn how to be decision makers in Kemet. So Kunanuk returns to plea for a sec to, uh, before Renzi, the lower court, a second time. Uh, flatters Renzi with his speech, my high steward, my lord, greatest of the great, richest of the rich. A mortal man dies along with his underlings, or will you be a man of eternity? And remember, in order to live through eternity, your heart has to be uh, lighter than a feather. You're going to be judged against the feather of Mott by Toth. And Toth is mentioned by name here uh, in the story. It is, is it not wrong? A balance that is crooked, a scale that is crooked. Justice is fleeing from you, expelled from its place. Officials are doing evil. The norm of speech is biased and judges are carrying off what it seizes. Wow. OK, so we're really talking about uh, um, how government hearings and government officials, particularly uh, judges, are supposed to act. And again, when we talk about judges, we're not always talking about the judiciary when we're talking about American law. Right. You got commissioners. You have um, um, bureaus. You have lots of people in government that get to decide whether this is the value. That is the value. This is the tax. That is the tax. This is the fee or this is not the fee. You're eligible for this or you're not eligible for that. And here we're saying that these folks are biased, right? That that is, and, and if we're talking about the ninth or 10th century dynasty, rather, uh, again, we're referring to an intermediate period. And the worth of this in the 12th dynasty is to caution people about this is how bad things were. The arbitrator is a cheat. He who should punish injustice is doing evil. It's going to go on like this, right? He talks about corruption specifically. He who measure, he, he who measures heaps of corn is pilfering for himself. Note about regulation here that commercial trade, regulation, measuring, right, uh, and fairness in, in uh, um, fair dealing. Uh, it goes about all types of different ways poor people are being cheated. He who should govern according to the laws is ordering theft. He who should dispel weakness is acting corruptly. He who should correct another is being crooked. He who should see has turned blind. One who should hear death and one who should lead has gone astray. Redress is short, but evil is long. The judges are a fattened basket. Speaking falsehood is their heritage. It lies light on their hearts. Wow, he is going in. Right. So he's not. So, again, this. But when we when we listen to him speak, he's not talking about them He's not talking about what happened in that day that his goods were stolen, right? See, again, this story is greater than that. This isn't about him pleading, oh, Nemtanak did something to me. This is him talking about the evils of corruption, of injustice, of disorder. 
He chastises them to not for sure, uh, chastises the wealthy. How lamentable is the poor man you ruin. You surpass the lady of pestilence. Who possesses bread should be merciful, whereas brutality is for the criminal. Theft suits those who without belonging. Things are robbed by a criminal, but an evil act of someone without need, is he not to be rebuked? He turns to Sensi, the governor. Rescue all who are drowning. Save the shipwrecked. That is within your reach. Still nothing happens. Still no justice, right? But he still got more to say. And basically, they're going to have him come out. They're going to have him come back until he has absolutely nothing more to say. They're going. To, on the one hand, this relates to, again, the, the teaching of the Tahotep, that a petitioner is supposed to be allowed to say everything they came to say, to not cut them off, to empty their belly, as Tahotep said. That's one part of this. On the other part of this, again, it's a fable or a proverb. So part of this is they want uh, Kunanup to keep coming back and, and give them everything he knows, to just exhaust them of all his wisdom and record it. So we class uh, Kun, and this also talks about justice being long, right? That even today, when we talk about the appeal, you may win your lawsuit, but then you have an appeal and an appeal and an appeal, and that stuff takes months and months and months and months. So this is also a precursor or a story about our time, about the, the time it takes justice. Time is also process when we talk about due process. Okay, if the process you give me is 10 years later, 30 years later, uh, justice is fleeting in that time. So he comes back for his third appeal. High steward, my lord, you are Ray, lord of heaven. You are happy who makes the meadows green and restores mounds that have been ravaged, punish theft and protect the poor. So now we're talking, invoking the gods, we're invoking Mott, but we're also telling, saying that these folks are there not just to bless those who have wealth. Right. Those who have wealth aren't the only ones that are in need or, or should be thankful to the gods or aligned with the gods. They are also there to represent the poor against the wealthy who presumably have wealth because they they, they uh, presumably followed the rules. They did what they were, quote unquote, supposed to do. But um, that doesn't mean the poor are without favor from the gods. Beware of the approach of eternity. Desire to last, as is said. Doing justice is breath for the nose. Inflict punishment on him who ought to be punished, and none will surpass your rectitude. Is Toth lenient? Then may you do evil. Right? Is Toth lenient? Then may you do evil. If Toth is soft, then yeah, then go ahead and do whack stuff. But we know what, Toph judges your heart against Mott's feather. And if it's if it's found wanting, it's found lacking, then I guess you get eaten up by Anubis. Uh, you're not gonna reach the, 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 the afterworld with Osiris or Osir and Aset. Withdraw the flood so as to do justice. To straighten out the land is to do justice. To not, do not speak falsehood for you are might. Do not be lighthearted for you are weighty. Do not speak falsehood for you are the scales. Do not rob but act against the robber. A great one who is greedy is not really great. Right. So again, this idea that I am wealthy, that makes me good. Nah, not at all. So uh, it doesn't quite say that um, um, a, can, uh, a rich man uh, uh uh, uh, easier for a camel to get through a needle's eye than a rich man in heaven. It doesn't go that far, but we know that the wealthy are going to have to recite the 42 confessions just as everyone else is. So after a while, um, <laughs> uh, Kunanub gets salty, right? He gets a little pissed off after, um, after having to come back. Justice for sale. Don't be one who wrongs his confident for his client. Okay, now, what? Don't be one who wrongs his confidant for his client. In other words, hold your friendship above your business. Wow. Anyone who comes and supplies to him is his brother. Don't be a ferryman who ferries across anyone who has the fare. A righteous man whose righteousness has crumbled. In other words, don't let your morality be bought off. The complete opposite of um, basically law and economics, which um, or, uh, which prioritizes economic fish efficiency and the wealth of the nation as above the commitment of the nation to justice, right? Um, and also, he also Kunanu cautions against a sham hearing. Hearer, you do not really hear, but why do you not hear? 
And we know this is a reference to wealth. This is a reference to the fact that everybody, all the wealthy are in cahoots together, making money so they don't want to piss each other off and actually cause justice. That might to a poor man when it could hurt uh, their standing amongst their peers. But their peers should be mod. It should be eternity. Uh, it should be justice. Look, you behold, you are the chief of a workhouse who won't let an unemployed person through at once. <laughs> wow. Again, I, I don't I just. I want to go beyond just the law and also show the sophistication of economic ordering in the 12th dynasty of Egypt. Uh, a, the chief, the manager of a workhouse, the manager of a factory who doesn't hire. Right. So we got manager, middle managers. We got government officials. We got wealthy. We got nobles. We got peasants. Um, we got all types of goods. We got all types of jobs. Um, we're really talking about um, it's really astounding to um Imagine that Old Kingdom Egypt is not all that much different than 15th, 16th, 17th, and maybe even 18th and 19th century America without electricity. Wow. So after this one, um, um, you know, don't be a ferryman who ferries across or anyone who has ferry. Now you're insulting his Renzi's integrity. And again, he has two cards restrain Kunanu, beats him a little bit. Um, and again, ne uh, uh, Renzi, just like Nemtanak, Renzi does not do it himself, right? This is an important part of this. It's not about physical might. It's not about physical power. It's about the fact that I have underlings that I can set upon you and make them do harm to you, which also includes them in the evil and helps uh, uh, um, wither the, the fabrics of society, especially when doing so is not just. Uh, the, um, well, I was just about to say. So, uh, also uh, note that Kunanu he doesn't stop, but not only does he not stop, he does not return violence, nor does he threaten violence. He will call you names. <laughs> he will tell you that you're going to hell, but he doesn't threaten violence of his own. He doesn't act out. He doesn't do that. So that's also a lesson again about. Uh, or that they're trying to instill about subverting oneself to the rule of law, even when the rule of law does not seem to be available to you to keep pressing, to keep petitioning for it. You are a town without a mayor, like a meeting without a chairman, like a ship without a captain, like a gang without a leader. You are a policeman who steals, a major who accepts bribes, a district overseer who, sh who should restrain robbery, robbery, but who has become a pattern for the criminal, <laughs> like a model for the criminal. You crook. <laughs> wow. He, he's going in. He, and he comes back a fourth time. They have him come back a fourth and pissed. Now he's sarcastic. He's already going from angry, but this eloquent peasant has gone from 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 highfalutin words uh, uh, to 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 uh, accusing them and insulting them uh, to even being sarcastic now. Because in the fourth time, he catches Renzi coming out of church, right? You know, you're not going to do justice by me, but you, I just catch you coming out of church worshiping, and he says, "May our our Sophies." From whose temple you have come, praise you. Goodness has been harmed. There is no accumulation of it. Uh, um, he's basically accusing them of being wanton, of lasciviousness. You are a hunter who slakes his desire, bent on doing what he wants, who harpoons hippopotami, shoots wild bulls, catches fish and snares birds. So now it looks, again, we're dealing with something different. Each time he comes back, we're dealing with just slightly different um, harm or, 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 or evil. So here we're talking about avarice, right? About wantonness, lasciviousness. Be tender uh, and also a little bit about some animal rights, right? That the idea that you shouldn't wantonly kill animals seems to be here, right? You are a hunter who slakes his desire, bent on doing what he wants, who harpoons hippopotami, shoots wild bulls, catches fish and snares birds, right? So this idea of equal protection of the law it seems to even include animals to a certain extent. Be tender-hearted so that you will learn justice. Suppress your choice for the good of him who enters humbly. Suppress your choice. That is what all modern administrative law is about. And apparently that's what all uh, uh, old school administrative uh, bureaucratic law was about. For there is no brute who attains excellence and there is no impatient man whom one turns to. Uh, your boy, when it comes to impatience, I got to learn a little bit about that. Tolerate one misdeed and it will become two. 
right? This again, this is law books. These, this is a treatise. This is theory. Um, um, this is for the scribes, for the justice, for them to justify their decisions on why they can't do what their friends want them to do. I can't do what I want to do. I have to do justice. As for a judge who ought to be punished, he is a pattern for the criminal. Fool, ignoramus. He called him fool, ignoramus. Piss boy. Wow. Helmsman, don't let your ship off course. Shade, don't be as the blazing sun. The eloquent peasant is setting it off. He is laying it down on these folks and he comes back a fifth time. The fisherman ravages the river. Behold, you are the same. Do not defraud a poor man of his property. The belongings of a pauper are his breath. To take them away is to stop his nose. So here in this fifth appeal, again, it's a slightly different appeal. This is more um, instead of doing harm to yourself and you're getting to heaven, instead of talking about uh, the society breaking down. This is what you're doing to poor people. This is how hard you're making it on folks that don't have. The belongings of a pauper are his breath. To take them away is to stop his nose. You were appointed to hear cases, to judge between litigants, and to punish the robber. But behold, what you are doing is supporting a thief. You were appointed to hear cases to judge between limits. Again, if there's nothing more clear to let you know that this is an administrative law treatise, that this is a jurisprudential treatise, um, um, uh, that is as clear as I think it can get. You are trusted, you ha yet you have become a transgress transgressor. Excuse me. You are appointed to be a dyke for the pauper, so that he so that he doesn't drown. Um, and so here again, this idea of due process being um, and its relation to equal protection is very strong here, right? That the idea that everyone gets treated the same, even though we don't say that this is a protected category in relation to whether law and regulations are, 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 are discriminatory, uh, we do um, recognize that impartiality um, is its own equal protection when it comes to race, gender, class, uh, political party, for, um, foreign, domestic, etc. Right? Uh, he comes back a sixth time. Uh, starts respectfully always, but then he turns faster. And I think this is also a legislative lesson for the judges that the longer this goes on, the shorter and more direct uh, your petitioners are going to get, even if it is the ones that are poor and ought to be offering the most quote unquote deference. He says, see with your own eyes, the arbitrator is a cheat, the peaser is causing misery, and he who should mitigate is causing suffering. Cheating diminishes justice. So render good account and justice will be neither insufficient nor excessive. You are educated, enlightened, and accomplished, but not for cheating. Your environment is corrupt. Molester of the entire land, the cultivator of wickedness. <laughs> Seventh appeal. High steward, my lord, you are the helm of the entire land. The land sails in accordance with your command. You are the equal of Toth, who judges without being partial. Subverter of the law. But this time he's not, this fire language ends, and now I'm just going in to rip you. Subverter of the law, destroyer of rectitude. There will be no poor man alive if justice does not attend to him when he is robbed. Right? There will be no poor man alive if justice does not attend to him when he is robbed. My speech is done and my misery has ended up before you. What more do you need? Your neglect will lead you astray. Your avarice will befool you and your greed will make you acquire enemies. Officials, right? He says officials, not just wealthy people. It doesn't say nobility. Officials should be people who dispel injustice, lords of goodness, craftsmen in creating what is, people who mend a severed head. Eighth time he comes back. Yep, yeah, eighth time, eighth time, eighth day, eighth meeting. I steward, my lord, one sinks low through greed. You are greedy, but it does nothing for you. Thief, robber, snatcher. The officials who are appointed to repel should be shelters from the aggressor. The officials who are appointed to eradicate falsehood. He is salty. And the fear you wouldn't permit me to appeal you. So then again, there's another, uh, this eighth appeal deals with fear. Right. How judges should not intimidate petitioners. Right. That that even um, without being said, the idea that this guy's a tough guy or he might get you or there might be some retribution subverts justice even beforehand. 
and the fear that of you the fear of you wouldn't permit me to appeal to you you do not perceive my heart the humble man who returns to make a complaint to you he cannot fear him to whom it is submitted to make his complaint you cannot fear him who submits it to you your plots of land are in the country your earnings are in the estates and your provisions in the storehouse do you live here you a citizen here just like everybody else officials are given to you and you are still robbing do justice for the Lord of justice, pen, papyrus, pallet of doth, beware of doing evil. Justice is for eternity. Nor do you give me a reward for this good speech that comes from forth from the mouth of Ray himself. Speak justice and do, do justice. The ninth, the ninth appeal deals with time. Don't delay. You haven't been swift. Don't be partial. Don't fend off someone who appeals to you. May you abandon this neglect and may your verdict be accounted. Finally, he's done, right? And the ninth appeal is very short. He's run out of everything he said. He's every uh, resort to justice and why from, from just respecting the gods, from respecting old time, from uh, uh, preventing disorder, from pre preservation of the poor, uh, from respecting your citizens, all, uh, um, all of these reasons why you should do justice, why you should be impartial, why you should treat everyone equally. He's finally done. And Renzi sends his two guards, the governor sends his two guards, the ones that beat him before. And he says, don't be afraid, peasant, because he thinks, oh, I'm going to get beaten again. I just, I was, I was really letting him have it. He knew he was going to get his ass beat. But he says, don't be afraid, peasant. peasant. And from a new papyrus roll, he had every petition read out according to its contents. Again, the record. So they have the record. Renzi does, in fact, bring the record. He, uh, record. That's why he didn't say anything. He didn't say no. He didn't say yes. But he takes the whole record and takes it unto the pharaoh. The high steward Renzi, son of Maru, delivered them to the majesty of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Neb Kare, justified, satisfied, and they pleased his heart more than anything in this entire land. Then his majesty said, Pass judgment yourself, son of Meru. And the high steward Renzi, son of Meru, sent to guards to fetch Nemtanacht. Then he was brought, and an inventory was made of his barley, his emmer, his donkeys, his swine, his small cattle, and gave it to the peasant. That is the tale of the eloquent peasant. Ta -da. Okay, so he does actually win in the end. The Pharaoh uh, saves him. But note, did you note that the Pharaoh still never sees him? The order is made and remanded to the lower court to make the correct decision. Right? See the parallels between now, then, and today. Uh, um, um, Kunanup never gets to speak to the Pharaoh directly, and the decision is not even made by the Pharaoh. He says, pass judgment yourself, son of Meru, that's, that's uh, Renzi, and uh, 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 Renzi sends the guards to fetch them to knock and then carries it out. So the Pharaoh doesn't take over and then have his vizier or someone else take over. No, he, uh, he appeals, he renders his decision, and then he remands it back to the lower court to render the decision consistent with his opinion amazing amazing and always remember that when we talk about the middle kingdom new kingdom 12th dynasty 8th 18th dynasty 19th the 20th the 25th all these great dynasties they were all trying to return egypt back to its so-called pristine state in the old kingdom um again these this is a very good example of how due process uh, um, just impartiality hearing um, all of these things that have are neutrally spoken of are um, also affect this idea of equal protection for the poor right um, it doesn't really talk about uh, um, equal protection with with general regulations and that's where we're going to go with equal, uh, afro atlantic and jurisprudence later but right now i think you get uh, a, a healthy dose of what we mean by both due process right the rights you have to get a fair hearing a notice and an opportunity to be heard and wow nine appeals you definitely have been heard um, but we know that that cost Again, uh, that's something that we don't recognize in American jurisprudence, that, that not, those nine appeals, uh, his wife and his children had to be supported in order for him to have the time to um, be in town that long to plead his case and, and create justice or a better sense of justice for the whole country, right? As today we would call perhaps a private attorney general. 
um, in a in a key tam suit, Q U I T A M, a key tam suit. However, the themes of Matt strongly uh, look how much the the themes of Matt strongly amounted avarice, right? Not just government um, um, conduct. It doesn't. It's not just aimed at arbitrariness and capriciousness and due process of law. It also restrains the idea of greed and wealth. It allows for it. It respects private property very much. So, um, note that um, um, Nemtanak is not arrested. Right. As a noble, he's still allowed to continue doing whatever he's doing as an official. There's nothing in the story about him being removed from office. There's nothing in the story about um, um, social order being disrupted and there not being any nobility. It is about how people of different classes should be treated equally. Um, and we also note that it just needs to be constantly reinforced. Um, and that establishing norms through fables, myths, allegories, parables, proverbs, we note that on the one hand, it, it denotes, it connotes Egyptian greatness. But if you think carefully about it, uh, the reason you have laws is because people break them. The reason why you have to reinforce these things is not because you have a society that's perfect. That is not because you have a society that represents utopia. It's quite the opposite. I don't have a law against murder unless people are already murdering. I don't have a law against uh, stealing unless someone is actually stealing. And I don't have an administrative law talking about impartiality and whatnot unless there's already a situation where government officials were being partial, when they were being biased. And we need these parables, these norms, these proverbs, these allegories, these myths, these fables to to influence people and cabin their discretion. Right. Law is, is aspiration. Norms and all that are aspirations. Um, again, um, this is deep with administrative law as far as integrity, again, about bias, impartiality, about consequences of um um, not following the rule of law, how social disorder uh, can be a, a very quick byproduct of it. Um, this also talked about justice delayed, timing as process. It also is an extremely great tale as far as appellate review and this idea of a record for 6,000 years ago where appeals were not done. We didn't redo the trial over again. We may have argument and those arguments are recorded and a decision maker of high makes a decision that rendered that is then passed down or remanded to its his lower subordinates to make it so in other words agency law that Renzi is an agent of the pharaoh that Nemtanak is an agent of Renzi um, also again the cost of legality um, I think it's wildly impressive that the pharaoh makes provisions for Kunanup and his family. I think it's very interesting and I don't exactly know why it's very important for Kunanup to not know where the uh, goods that uh, sustain him had come, come from. Um, it's very interesting about how Kunanup is expected to be very respectful at the beginning and the beginning of each of the nine sessions and yet how uh, that patience or that honorary or that honorificness, uh, um, that reverence wears thin quickly as the appeals go on. And I think that's a lesson to both the petitioner and the lesson to both judges. Uh, and again, uh, the last thing that I find most impressive about the tale of the eloquent peasant is how, uh, again, it's remanded with instructions, damages, the properties are seized immediately. Um, again, the regularity of authority, the regularity of how the state operates and how justice once um, is, uh, um, we expect a fair hearing. And once the fair hearing is decided, then the consequences for the wrongdoer are exacted swiftly right and completely and I also again want to remind that this seems to be an administrative law concept this seems to be a contract law concept or a tort law concept that this is outside of criminal law right the idea of uh, again um, arresting or punishing people based on their wrongdoings that this was all about compensating Kun Anup for something bad that had happened to him. So when we talk about, uh, so we've run the gamut of different legal exercises from from private rights to public rights, property law, um, um, court, uh, tort law, contract law, um, a little bit of criminal law in here. The tale of the eloquent peasant is just a fantastic, fantastic 
um, um, uh, book, right? Um, but one of, that's the second famous, most famous book uh, in the Nile Valley and Agent Kevin, written over 4,000 years ago, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation of it. Uh, our next episode, we're going to continue talking about equal protection in the Nile Valley, and we're going to talk about Queen Hatshepsut. We're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk about matriarchy, matrilineality, and the idea that uh, um, not just ancient Egypt, but uh, then going back to Nubia, Kush, Kerm, etc., that African matriarchy at, um, was ubiquitous and stands out as a distinguishing characteristic between it and its an African cultural unity on the one hand, and uh, um, um, the cultures of those outside Africa, on the other hand, that are more patriarchal, patrilineal. Um, and so this idea of uh, Queen Hatshepsut, to me, being the greatest queen to ever live and pretty much should be called Empress Hatshepsut is something that we're going to talk about tomorrow, along with other women, uh, female pharaohs of the, of the original dynasties, um, female doctors of Egypt, uh, the daughters of Amon. Um, the cult of Isis, right? Women played a huge, 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 huge part uh, in pre-colonial Egypt uh, mythology and norm setting. So please uh, subscribe again to the Afrolanicon.com, the YouTube channel. Um, please uh, go to Amazon Kindle and purchase the book, uh, Taxes, Death, and Trouble, How Star of the Beast uh, create, uh, Created the Black Lives uh, Matter Movement. And we will be back tomorrow to talk about uh, Queen Hatshepsut and equal protection of law as it relates to gender in Nile, Va Nile Valley civilizations. Once again, always uh, remember uh, to uh, better educate ourselves and our children. Let's start and patronize black businesses. Let's stop unduly criticizing each other. We're talking about black capital accumulation uh, of the financial, social, human, and political capital. Hotep.